Welcome to the next episode of Catalyzing Radical Systemic Change, where it's all about discovering, mapping, and cross-pollinating what I think are the necessary building blocks towards a planetary civilization ahead. And obviously, I think money is a crucial uh, issue. And where that money goes to and what are the criteria by which money is invested. So I'm feeling very grateful to be in this virtual room together today with Christine terbrock Forstinger. She's a renowned expert in the field and an impact and conscious investor herself. So Christine, I'm super curious, like always in my podcasts, I don't leave the person with whom I'm sharing this precious time with out as a person. So I'm, I'm really curious to dive into your biography and find these two or three turning moments where you became aware that actually investing, ESG, impact investing, and then ultimately conscious investing was your purpose. Christine, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, dear Alistair, for the invitation um, to your amazing podcast. And I must already say, before we kick it off, I love the topic. Uh, and also, I find it uh, yeah, absolutely uh, important that you drive the topic of systemic change. And um, that is also a topic yeah, that I'm so passionate about. Um, I think... Going back to your question, what were the kind of turning points in my uh, in my life, in my like my personal life? Um, I think actually there were two two big uh, awakening moments, so to say. Uh, one uh, was um, in when I was still a bit younger, when um, I actually finished my master studies in America after um, I had completed my studies in Austria and I come from a very entrepreneurial background. And so I thought, okay, I really have studied enough. I want to work. And I was supposed to get my first job in a Wall Street law firm. And that would have been in the World Trade Center. And I was so excited and really looking forward to that job. Um, but um, actually uh, one of the partners called me that they had to turn down that job offer Uh, and instead of me being an Austrian citizen, they were taking on a German citizen because that office, that law firm actually had an office in Frankfurt also at the time. And I said, I need to, because of visa issues, send uh, that German colleague then after a year back to their Frankfurt office. So meaning uh, three weeks before 9-11, I was actually, um, that offer for me was was turned down Then my Basically, my world was kind of destroyed because I thought, oh, Lord, now I have no job and what should I do? And I wanted to stay in America. And then on September 11, I realized, wow, apparently, um, yeah, things are connected on a larger scale in life. So this was um, an awakening moment where I realized um, that it really, yeah, definitely things are connected on a larger scale. And I'm super happy to dive into that Uh, a little bit uh, deeper later. And I think the, the second, um, yeah, turning point in my life that really brought me then um, not only on a personal level, but also on a, yeah, uh, basically on a content level, much closer to impact investing or ESG investing at the time, or even I started with kind of, Yeah, uh, uh, easy strategies uh, in uh, basically, uh, I'm, I'm super happy to dive into that. So I was actually working for Bank Julius Baer um, um, in 2008. So I started uh, at the bank in 2005. And um, so um, at the time, I privately co-founded a project in Ghana, West Africa, uh, where I'm still very much involved with. It's a community development project where... We want to um, basically help to abolish illegal orphanages, but that's a, a separate big topic that uh, where my heart is absolutely burning for. Um, and where I'm still very much involved with um, since the early founding days of, of our NGO. 
Um, and I came back from my first trip to Ghana in 2008 and my boss said, Christine, we have that weird request from a family office. They want to structure basically to their fund. So I was in the fund structuring team. Um, they want to also structure social return. And for us at the time, that was so new. And I, I came back from Austria and my boss said, well, you come back, sorry, from Africa. And you, he said, you come back from Africa, you look into this and um, you come up with a solution better, yeah, tonight and not tomorrow. And so I really looked into this and thought, okay, that makes a lot of sense to me personally to combine actually these two worlds. This was also 2008, as you remember uh, the time of the financial crisis. And, um, and so kind of a fire got ignited and that never uh, got extinguished up to today. And um, yeah, and so um, after a while, um, I actually changed to one of our, I, I thought at the time, uh, yeah, most interesting clients, which was a sustainable asset management company here in Zurich. Um, and so, yeah, basically I started off uh, um, working for them and then eventually um, founded my own company. But uh, these were like two turning points in life, one a bit earlier, the other one uh, a bit later. Um, that, yeah, that really drove me towards uh, the whole impact investing movement, basically. And also uh, it broadened my, my personal consciousness, definitely. And also helped me to, um, yeah, to basically start with mindfulness practice on my own. And for me, this all goes hand, hand in hand. As I think as we're anyway having a very open conversation today. Um, yeah, so uh, I think it's, it's always important to to consider the connected whole even on a, on a personal level but even on an economic level yeah definitely what i would like um almost like educate uh the listeners or those watching the video is impact investing in itself is let's say quite a broad topic so when you look at the market from the outside and you look at like, let's say broad ESG, which stands for environmental, social and governmental issues to impact investing. And then towards your own terminology of conscious investing, could you both link that to your biography still? And ultimately, why are you framing your own investment approach, not integral investing? or impact investing, but conscious investing. I'm super curious on that. Yeah, maybe uh, like on a personal level, <clears throat> I'm actually a yoga teacher since 2008. And um, not that I practice like or give classes because unfortunately I like time. Of course, I practice personally. And uh, I think I'm, I'm super happy to share that meditation forms an integral part of my life. Um, but when you see things holistically, this is also, you know, um, you cannot actually separate this from how you look uh, at investments and also, you know, um, uh, basically investments are energy, right? And uh, you can actually channel them into positive energy. And um, I think what's um, important um, is maybe, maybe as, you know, for for the for a framing perspective, I think it's it's maybe good to to quickly reshare share with our audience what actually impact investing is. So impact investing is basically investing with the intention. That's important. The intention to create a positive social and or environmental impact alongside a financial return. <clears throat> so that's already very much proactive vis-a-vis, -vis, let's say, classical ESG investing that you've mentioned, Alistair, right? Uh, so, um, which is much more passive and impact investing is much more active. You really want to create a positive impact vis-a-vis, um, -vis, let's say, <clears throat> for example, an ESG strategy um, related to listed stocks where you usually have a way more passive approach. I think the most active form uh, in no, for ESG investments um, are, for example, um, yeah, engagements, shareholder votings. But when you uh, 
basically go a step further and say, so what is actually conscious investing? Um, and this links to basically my view of seeing things holistically and really also with investments really driving systemic change. So from my perspective, and this is what I've tried to, to summarize together with some other amazing colleagues um, and a wonderful uh, long-time impact investors in, in my book, Conscious Investing in 2017, is that conscious investing basically enlarges the picture um, beyond the intention to create a social and or environmental impact, but it brings a systemic view to the investor. Um, and from, from my perspective, or at least how I've summarized it in the book, conscious investing is really a state of personal awareness so that you really realize things are connected um, in life, but also in investing with your investment decisions. Um, and uh, so basically conscious investing is a state of, let's say, personal awareness, uh, as well as a form of uh, yeah, a holistic form of impactful investing. So it goes a step further, basically, than impact investing and brings this systemic perspective. And we can dive deeper into what that means, um, maybe also later with some examples. But um, yeah, maybe maybe to, to frame the conversation in that perspective. And conscious investing is really uh, a topic that I'm burning for. Also, our company is called Chi meaning cheese, positive life energy, but also stands for conscious, holistic and impactful investing. Yeah, why not, why not directly pick a couple of examples? So I imagine you need to have criteria of finding, vetting, then obviously the due diligence process and then investing into the endeavors, but also accompanying them for multiple years. So how about, I don't mind, two, three, four examples in your own portfolio that you chose, usually after quite a lengthy and deep process to invest into and identify also with, because you really think from a broad conscious perspective, they really unlock levers for systemic change. So curious to listen into a couple of examples. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> you, you mentioned something very nice and very important to unlock levers for systemic change. So um, it's really about solving root causes and not investing only in symptoms, right? So really promoting that systemic change towards a regenerative economy, plus also a regenerative society that also go hand in hand. Um, maybe when we start with, let's say, uh, the due diligence process, um, you so what we do for example we look uh, we also take a lot of time for the due diligence not only on the financial side on the obviously also of course on the impact side and on the scaling potential of those companies but also going a step further and also really looking very closely um, on this element of you know that goes very much into the depth of the matter, uh, basically of avoiding unintended negative side effects. Because when you are really interested in basically creating deep impact, then um, it's, it's also about being sure, at, at least you know, with your initial investment, and we can talk about what, what's happening during the lifetime of an investment, where there can be um, situations where you have to make trade-offs. But when you do the initial investment, when you deploy the capital for the first time, <clears throat> you should really be sure to also avoid unintended negative side effects. I give you a very simple um, example. For example, when you um, would do an investment, let's say in an onshore wind farm, um, and uh, when you look closer through let's say an environmental and social due diligence, when you look a little bit through the veil uh, and say, well, uh, where uh, is this wind park actually built on? Does there, let's say, 
is, is deforestation necessary in order to build that wind park? Then a real impact investor would definitely not do that investment, or we would definitely not do that investment. And that is also something, uh, for example, that's really happening uh, in practice. Those are not examples that are not happening. So for example, I was at the conference um, it's now about a year ago, where the president, she's an amazing lady of the Sami parliament, was there. The Sami people are the people um, in, in north of Europe um, that basically herd their reindeers across um, three Nordic countries, very much in the north. And, and uh, that lady, actually, the president of the Sami parliament, she she shared, she said, there were actually Swiss investors claiming to be green investors investing um, I think it was in Norway, and um, but for that actually, um, my my people, the Sami people, had to be relocated from a certain area because, uh, yeah, I mean our our space is just getting less and less through actually green investments. So uh, yeah, so I think it's it's really important to dive in deeper. Uh, what 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 is really this positive impact potential? Uh, and there, an impact investor usually has to be quite strict. Um, I, I think we um, we all get the example with the wind park, like from the outside, kind of looks nice. But when you look through the veil, it has unattended, like second order and maybe also third order effect. The second order yeah. effect being maybe deforestation, or you know that the people have to relocate. There's multiple possibilities for that. So let's leave that with that example. Can you choose one example that you're like excited or two examples that you're excited that were passing the various veils of your own vetting process and the due diligence process where like the initial deployment of the capital can unlock further positive systemic uh, effects? I mean, I can give you an example <clears throat> from our uh, portfolio. Um, for example, that is also not, you know, I mean, this sounds all very nice and very kind of potentially intelligent uh, from a theoretical point of view. In practice, it's it's way harder to implement. So I give you, for example, <clears throat> an insight into um, a due diligence that, that we have gone through and um, with the risk actually that they would kick us out of the due diligence because we were the party doing the most intense due diligence on that company and actually that company could pick and choose their investors. So um, yeah, so we were basically the, 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 the complicated ladies, um, but, but for something very good. Um, so I, I give you an insight. So that was a company in our portfolio. They're, they're active in the energy transition space. And um, so um, they are basically um, sourcing uh, the components for the batteries. Um, they have a kind of a one-stop shop solution, including uh, batteries, uh, an energy management tool and the financing tool um, to kind of scale the energy transition. Um, and we were saying so, you know, also discussing this internally very, very much saying, so basically what is, you know, the benefit of the green energy transition in Europe if the loop does not close? So if it goes back, for example, I'm not even talking about the, the, the working conditions in China, but maybe also, um, you know, the sourcing of those batteries in Congo, the contaminated rivers, children working in the mines. So we were actually challenging this company massively during the due diligence process, as I said, with the risk to be kicked out of the process um, to actually uh, challenge them and say, well, are you actually willing to collaborate uh, post investments with us very intensely on, let's say, your sourcing process, on becoming a pioneer uh, in that field of becoming more transparent, um, also in in the whole sourcing of your company. And uh, and they actually said, 
honestly, we really like it that you challenge us so intensely on that because we want to become a role model company also for other companies. Um, and that is exactly what we wanted to achieve. We actually also, uh, with every investee company, we sign a side letter on that. And basically for the intense, close impact collaboration post-investment and that impact collaboration or actually that impact value creation, as we call it, um, then also directly um, has, a, has a building block um, to assisting the companies to becoming more conscious, you know, not only on the sourcing side, but also on their composition side of their teams, on their, of their boards, on, on, let's say, gender perspective, inclusion perspective, inclusion perspectives. Um, so basically helping the companies to become more conscious themselves and eventually creating an ecosystem of conscious entrepreneurs with cross-selling opportunities. That's the ultimate goal. My sense is, that's very interesting, is you... I perceive you as shaping the market, right? So you're you're basically challenging on the fringes of impact investing through your conscious investing approach for people to really become role models. I think with the example from, as we all know, the sourcing of rare earth is a very complex process. Um, it's also a beautiful example of showing us on a planetary scale how much everything is uh, connected. Mm. Just, just to cite a, a, another guy in my portfolio, Indy Johar, he always says, to build a smartphone, we needed like 13.5 billion years of evolution and a whole planet, you know, and thousands of years of cultural evolution to be able to construct just one smartphone. So um i think also when we look like further down the line that you want to create an ecosystem obviously also from an investment point of view with cross-selling opportunities um what are maybe one or two other positive examples so that we have like okay really making uh, a company that is crucial in the energy transition a role model for sourcing rare earth okay this unlocks like multiple second and third order effects like positively. What is another example that you're excited of in your portfolio? I think we are um, very much excited about all companies, uh, the LSDR in our portfolio because uh, we're really collaborating very, very closely with them. Um, I think that starts on different levels because um, some are a little bit younger in, uh, let's say, <clears throat> their company structure. Others are already a little bit more evolved, have bigger teams. So it always depends. Um, but um, so I think in that perspective, it's also very important to, and this is what we do, to really look at the very specific uh, let's say circumstances also needs of the company. So for example, with one company, <clears throat> we, um, I mean, it would be easy from our side. Let's, let's, let's please share this uh, to, to actually say, well, uh, dear management team, we actually uh, recommend to implement these three KPIs uh, and please start measuring this. But that would from our perspective, makes zero sense to because we really believe that um, also the definition of the KPIs really needs to be in the best interest of the company and also really create value of the companies. Just, the companies. I, yes. I, I just feel drawn towards making a very short parenthesis. So KPI stands for Key Performance Indicators. Um, exactly. So usually Key Performance Indicators are only geared towards financial performance. I just wanna, you know, put this bracket for the listener. Non-financial key performance indicators are for impact investors and obviously also even more for conscious investors. Those indicators that you can measure against 
an impact that you want to create through deploying uh, the capital. I just felt like I needed to make that short parenthesis. Oh, thank you very much, dear Alistair. Sorry, I was I was jumping right in, and 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 uh, maybe I have to make it more specific. Exactly. So those KPIs that I was referring to were actually uh, the non-financial. Um, key performance indicators, so basically the impact targets, if, if you want to say so. Um, and, and we realized together in um, an analysis with the company that it does not make sense uh, for that specific company to just start measure uh, something. I mean, it would be easy to uh, to just come up with three KPIs, but we said, no, uh, it's, it's way more important that we dive deeper uh, and doing a life cycle analysis and, and to come really up with, K, with KPIs or impact targets that make a total fit for the company. And you've asked me, so what are examples where you're proud of? I think we are basically proud of um, each collaboration that we are having with each company. It's in every then, case, it's then let a me, bit different. Let me, mm -hmm. let, let me be more specific. Yeah. So when I was listening into you know, because obviously those listeners can't, you know, listen into your whole portfolio. Um, I think the sourcing uh, the rare earth um, and making this a role model unlocks systemic effects on a, yeah. on a first order. So like creating the KPIs, sourcing the minerals, but second order, creating an ecosystem where those, mm -hmm. you know, supply and demand side of the rare earth collaborate better so that also others can learn to more easily um, uh, mine these uh, rare earths. So um, I'm, I'm curious from a systemic uh, perspective, mm -hmm. uh, if you could cite, yeah, yeah. one or two other examples. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think then uh, we can make it very easy. This is actually a very nice example uh, that, 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 that you've brought up. So basically this, this second tier. Um, so very simple example, for example, is that um, um, already three of our portfolio companies um, are in close exchange because <laughs> they very much like what the others are doing. So for example, uh, and we are not only in, uh, let's say, as you know, right, not only in uh, the climate tech sector, uh, which is a, a burning issue in Europe, but as we know, um, so things are interconnected amongst the SDGs and um, there are other also burning issues um, in, let's say, avoiding the plastic space. So in the circular economy space, um, in the food tax space, food systems transformation space, in making cities smarter and more sustainable. So things are connected. So we are actually investing in companies in different sectors. Uh, next, for, next to, for example, um, the company in the energy transition space, we're investing in food tech, we're investing in green innovation. Um, so for example, a company where we have invested in Moza Meat, uh, a pioneer from the Netherlands, um, basically in, in the process of um, producing um, cultivated meat, basically. So uh, meat from the lab. Um, um, they are, for example, talking to Neom Group, uh, the company that I've mentioned before, um, from Austria, uh, the pioneer uh, in the energy transition space where we have invested uh, to actually make uh, their building, um, yeah, basically, um, yeah, to, to basically um, also uh, supply it with decentralized energy, right? Whatever, also talking uh, the, the vertical farm where we, have, where we have invested here in Zurich, um, actually was also talking to Neom Group uh, already because they also said, actually, we want to, um, we are really interested in becoming basically self-reliant and uh, independent from the grid. Um, and also, uh, for example, Mozambique is interested in the basil that Yasai is producing. So I think that is then a, a next step. It's, it's a first step. It's a small step, you know, but the most important thing from my perspective and from our perspective as a team is you have to start somewhere. And when you can already show first small 
but still effects that help unlock systemic change that is already quite powerful, even if it's a first step. Yeah, so I, the sense that I get is instead of investing just quote unquote per vertical, um, you're interconnecting the different uh, pieces in the puzzle and you create an ecosystem that you're actually deploying capital into and where already with the three mentioned examples, people are creating a, a, a cohort and a first small ecosystem uh, to learn from one another. Exactly, um, exactly. So that's, for example, uh, we, we said uh, we want to invest in companies that really help to solve the burning issues of our time. That was actually the working title of our fund. And then in the end, we thought, okay, it's a, yeah, it's, it's, it's a total perfect match for, for what we want to do. And um, yeah, anyway, today it's obvious that um, even what, what we see in the news, right? I mean, several, we have those wildfires in, uh, across Europe. I mean, it's, it's crazy hot, um, probably the hottest year on record, I would assume 2022, uh, so far at least. And um, yeah, so it's, it's really showing that things are inter, interconnected, interrelated, and uh, that it's possible to create systemic change to, through actually also that collaboration or, yeah, um, yeah, exactly. It would be a collaboration amongst these companies that they invest also in it, in each other, right? Or actually sell actually um, products uh, to each other. Let's let's um, fly on a higher plane of abstraction. Mm -hmm. When you see the whole market for ESG investing moving, and bearing in mind that. The road to hell is paved with good intentions. Where would you personally draw a line into these are good intentions? I kind of also see that. But for me, that's a red flag where I personally um, don't agree with the measures or the criteria that are taken. Because I perceive you as like shaping the market, driving the market. And obviously also we wish in that conversation that with the impact you make, you also inspire others, other impact investors to move the needle within their own uh, criteria, vetting decisions and due diligence project, uh, process. So I'm really curious to, to, to lean into where do you see, I mean, the market does not exist, but I mean, when you look at the whole of ESG investments, then the smaller chunk of impact investing, and then your own, let's say, small niche of conscious investing, where, where would you draw some lines? Where do you see it moving? And also, yeah, where are things maybe moving in, in a wrong direction to your own opinion? I think this is a super important question. Um... It's also quite a complex question, but uh, I think the answer can be relatively simple. When you actually um, see the SDGs, and I always like, um, you know, like, like that uh, kind of picture in front of me, those, um, the SDGs as a frame, kind of as a roof, you know, um, and uh, sort of sustainable development goals, right? And um, in order that they, they're supposed actually that we achieve them until 2013, until, I mean, there's this inbuilt timeline, which is so short. Um, and in order that we basically unlock these massive amounts of capital, both public and private, private is even more important. Um, it's, I think it's very important that we cannot achieve that alone with impact investments. And we uh, also very much need um, sustainable investments and also responsible investment strategies. But you have said, Christine, so where would you see a red flag? And I, I think um, what we observe in the market right now, you know, is also uh, 
so much impact washing going on and so much green washing, however you call it, rainbow washing, pink washing, whatever. But so what the sector desperately needs is more integrity in order to scale. So how actually um, can we achieve that? I mean, there are no real standards out there when you ask me and I could talk, I think for an hour about it, um, the whole SFDR, Sustainable Financial Disclosure Regulation, does not need the move and uh, does not need, sorry, does not move the needle at all. Um, it's the it's an EU uh, regulation, so it's it's all about basically sustainable investing and not really targeted for impact investments. Um, so for us, it really does not make sense, honestly. Um, but even though as, as we have classified as a as a dark green fund, you know, but it's the whole regulation is really more um, for sustainability funds. Um, so the challenge is actually that um, right now, when you have basically, and, and let me please explore a little bit further because it's important, when you have the right advisors and when you can pay the right advisors, and um, I don't, um, I mean, I don't shy uh, to be so outspoken on that, you can easily comply whatever as a dark green fund, not that we do that because um, we are still a small team with a small budget. And uh, uh, But if you are a, a large fund, you hire the right advisors, you pay for it and you get it, tick the box and it's greenwashing. Um, and I'm very outspoken on that. So what is much more helpful is that you take that very serious when you when we speak about that intention that we originally spoke about when we define an impact investment that intention for positive impact creation and when you take it serious when you basically also um, set down that intention in in writing in your fund documents in your fund prospectus when you for example um, tie your performance fee as a fund uh, to the positive impact outcomes, right? So to basically set up an impact incentive structure, make an impact carry, um, those things, be really transparent in the impact reporting. Those are very aligned to the existing standards out there, IRIS plus metrics, IMP uh, plus, and so on and so forth. There, there are standards out there that everybody can use. But um, what I think is important and what is a red flag um, is actually when today it's all mixed up and when you say um, uh, basically ESG investing is really sold as impact investing. So a professor in a, in a Stanford article, I like that article a lot, he says, well, uh, you should consider uh, that as the 13th strike at the clock. Um, and real, let's say, real impact can only be achieved through, let's say, direct investment strategies. Either you invest directly in a company or through a fund that invests directly. So um, what I want to say is that uh, there is currently a need in order to achieve the SDGs to have several strategies in parallel impact next to sustainable investing, next to responsible strategies. They are they're way more passive than impact investing. So we, we need all these strategies, but uh, for the investors, it's very difficult right now to basically look through. So what is what? It's all mixed up and that's a problem. So I think every fund manager should actually adhere to relatively strict standards for its own, right? To make it very transparent for, for his investors um, that the investors really uh, yeah, can understand, well, is this an impact fund or is it not an impact fund? And uh, um, there's a very nice article out there from one of our advisory board members, Charlie Kleisner. He actually said, well, you know, there is this transition going on from the broad impact economy to the deep impact economy. Right now, we actually need both. Well, obviously, the impact, the deep impact economy is the one that really drives systemic change, that really creates that transformative impact. But um, we, it's an, 
right now we actually need the whole approach, right? Uh, we cannot exclude also the, uh, let's say, the broad impact economy because we need it to achieve the SDGs. Um, but at least from an investor's perspective, as an investor, you should be very much aware what your intention is. Do I want to be more passive? Do I want to be more active? And then ideally, I could pick and choose as an investor, do I want to invest in responsible strategies, in sustainable strategies, or really in impact? And that should be clear for an investor. And that's a bit the challenge right now, uh, that it's not so clear. Um, and that, uh, yeah, uh, products are just, um, yeah, many, many products that are not real impact products are labeled as impact products right now. So... I'm not a layman because I'm also like, uh, you know, I study macroeconomics and I've been touching the field of impact investing now for quite exactly uh, 10 years. Um, but I want to sketch a metaphor. Um, when the EU regulation for um, organic food got out, I forgot when exactly, some 10 years ago, up until then there was just a scattered tapestry within the nation states of Europe with criteria for organic food, you know? So there was, I can only say this for Germany, there was, for example, Bioland, Demeter, and mm -hmm. Gea. And then obviously, the, or not obviously, but this is what happened on the European level, the criteria for organic food on a European level, so that you get, so to say, the stamp you know, for it in order to be organic is less strict than, let's say, for example, Demeter, which comes from this anthroposophical uh, background. But nevertheless, although we still have, I would say, too little investment overall in the organic agriculture sector, it pretty much moved the needle. So mm -hmm. there's two perspectives on that. Those in the deep change, let's say, for the sake of the exercise, the Demeter people, there's still a deep outcry because they say the weaker vetting criteria, you know, for the EU stamp are actually greenwashing what really like deep organic agriculture needs. And it's also mm -hmm. from an emotional standpoint and knowing the criteria, the perspectives that I can take. But nevertheless, moving the overall needle also for bigger swaths of land to be organically certified and providing more people with organically certified food regulated by the um, EU pretty much moved the needle towards more supply of organic food. So when I see the market moving and you shaping it, what are things that you think need to happen in the next let's say horizon two let's make it three to five years in order to move overall the needle towards less greenwashing and more deep impact all whilst we also need we also need that fluffy intermediate esg uh investing and i know this is a i mean this is not something we can answer, just the two of us, but I definitely want to stay in that, uh, you know, spicy soup for a moment. <laughs> indeed, it is. It's indeed a spicy soup. I think, Alistair, I mean, um, I think it's really important that, um, you know, as there are no real standards or not these standards of integrity out there for impact fund managers that at least... If you claim to be an impact fund manager, you adhere yourself. I mean, obviously, of course, to all um, whatever the, the, the standards, the definitions of the global impact investing network of what impact investing actually means to the measurement and so on, but also to keep integrity really high. As I said, uh, ideally, you bind your carry towards the creation of positive impact outcomes. Um, so raising integrity, I think, is very much important in the field. And um, um, yeah, I think that's, that is very much important. And also, I think it's really important to be able to showcase um, some very cool investment stories 
with really transformative impact, uh, companies uh, that are on, let's say, a strong growth path, uh, creating really transformative impact with core regenerative business models where the impact is really ingrained in the company's product or in their service to, to show, well, actually with those products or with those services that shift towards this new economy, towards a regenerative economy is actually possible, right? That's one thing that this, this drive, basically that this shift uh, on one hand is ongoing, or actually it's even, um, it's that this is speeded up. On the other hand, and this refers to the statement of uh, the, let's say the broad impact economy of before, we may also not forget that there are huge um, super tankers, huge uh, companies out there, conglomerates, um, uh, you know, and it's also important there even if these are like way smaller steps and um, but also that these companies you know are actually changing their business models or at least adapting them to uh, yeah to basically help to achieve the SDGs to become more sustainable also in their business practices that we make this overall shift happen a question then Let's zoom again out of your own investments. Uh, when you look back into the last couple of years, what are a couple of companies um, where you see the core of the business model uh, moving the needle towards a regenerative economy or disrupting or challenging uh, a market segment? Because I think I have a couple of examples, but I'm curious to listen in from your side can give a couple of pointers. So what I find specifically interesting is um, uh, complementing or um, yeah, complementing meat. So uh, the whole industry of uh, tofu, um, which again has the problem of soy, but if soy is organically certified, then I definitely think it moves the needle towards let's say the carbon footprint, but not only the carbon footprint, also the biodiversity and uh, everything, you know, that, that uh, yeah, uh, that we eat makes a difference. Um, another one, which is also in the segment is, I know that the uh, uh, whole sector of uh, milk is yeah. uh, greatly challenged with yeah. oat milk and almond milk. And then again, we have the problem with almond needing a lot of water. So they have a huge, let's say, uh, backpack of how much uh, water needs to be uh, poured into um, almond uh, trees. But for example, when I look at oat milk, this might be, I mean, this is a very hipster example, mm -hmm. but we know both with weird second order effects that Oatly is supporting political endeavors that might, you know, we, we both uh, do not support, but let's leave that aside for the discussion. So I really think Oatly is a very good example of yeah. a company becoming incredibly powerful yeah. and really disrupting a whole segment of the market, which is the milk industry. And I'm curious if you can cite um, other examples, even again, if they're not in your own portfolio of uh, companies you're investing into with your fund. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I totally agree with what you're saying, Alistair. Um, so, I mean, obviously for me, it's, it's easier to talk uh, about the companies where we have invested or that we have looked at very, very closely and then for a certain reason have not invested. Um, but um, I must say those companies have these, let's say, yeah, business models um, where the impact is really ingrained. So it's really a key element uh, of, their offering, right, of the product, of their service. And um, I mean, for example, when, when we look how the meat market, just as an example, is trans or has been already transformed or is starting to transform, I mean, this is totally insane. I come from a butcher's family. And um, so uh, my father, my grandfather, even um, the father of my grandmother, uh, they were all butchers and um, 
maybe maybe that's the reason why I'm actually a, a vegan. <laughs> no, uh, but um, I must say when you look and, and we have we have done a deep dive on how the meat market will change over the next um, 20 years and that will be tremendous even for um for the companies currently so strongly interrelated uh, or the sectors like uh, whatever the um dünger sector right so the or um uh whatever leather production sectors um so for example uh, a very very quick outlook is that uh, the meat market will transform uh, from let's say 90% traditional meat market um as of today and uh, the rest being alternative protein and that rises as we, as we anyway know and as we have seen during covid um dramatically um it will change basically uh, to one third uh, being still traditional meat, and there the, there are the different buckets in there. Uh, also being, let's say, meat very, let's say, grass-fed beef, very sustainably, organically sourced, but also unfortunately still traditional factory farming. Uh, this will all be in this is one pillar. The other pillar will be alternative protein, exactly from things that you've mentioned before, like. Uh, whatever soy right soy peas so uh, uh, whatever mushrooms um, and the other market will the other the other pillar like uh, another third will be actually um, meat from cultivated sources basically so real cultured meat from the lab and from let's say a climate perspective this has a dramatic and and very very strong uh, positive impact right also already and it always depends on how for example um the sourcing takes place and you've you've given uh this this great example for example with the almonds that we all know in california um uh, yeah i mean leads to a water shortage because uh i mean all these almonds need to be um need, need a lot of water in in california for example um so it always depends how are actually um, yeah how how is the sourcing uh, taking place on on the plant based side. But for example, a sector that is dramatically also um, growing is um, the cultivated milk sector, for example, or cultivated eggs. So these these are things that nobody even talked about like ten years ago and. Um, uh, these are really transformative solutions out there um, that have a tremendous positive environmental impact for our planet. Um, so before we dive into, let's say, the final stages of our encounter today is uh, I, I learned that moving the needle, shaping the market, is a big effort uh, and creating the ecosystem within the portfolio of companies you're investing into already has a you know is starting uh, to have effects and i also take away like that conscious investing means that you look already in the vetting and due diligence process that the companies you're investing into really have the potential to unlock systemic change, but also have as core of their business model systemic change. Um, and I think the, the sustainable sourcing of rare earths is one example that everybody can take back. A second one is how disruptive, obviously, uh, cultured meat is. Is there maybe a last example out of the portfolio companies that you wanna, wanna give uh, to the audience. I mean, I'm super happy to do so, dear Alistair. Um, um, so, for example, do you have an example yeah. in the plastic sector? Yeah, 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 yeah. I was just thinking, actually, <laughs> this was like a Gedankenübertragung. I was actually just thinking about that. So we have invested in a 
<clears throat> pioneering company in Germany um, in, the, in the space of reducing single-use plastics, also very important topic um, of our days where also EU regulation has kicked in uh, and uh, which is forbidden, um, at least within the European Union, uh, to, to use uh, single-use plastics. Um, and um, so this is a, a reusable uh, bowl system, basically. And what we really liked about that German company is that they make the whole, you know, use of these bowls very easy for the end user because it's always, you know, in the end, it's always, you know, people are convenient. People are need to, it needs to be easy for people to to apply, um, yeah, uh, or to actually, um, if if you order a food, then you pick it up in in the bowl. Uh, that's actually very easy and, and this is exactly what that company has done they have uh, installed a, a pre-order mechanism um, on their website where you can actually pre-order the food in the partner restaurant and pick it up in that reusable bowl um, and um, th that is also something where we see a huge growth in the market um, for such solutions then I don't know if it will be the final question. Let's see. But <laughs> as we both most likely agree, we're at a very intense inflection point. Some call it the multi-crisis. I personally prefer to call it the great transition that we are all in towards becoming stewards of this planet and taking all our genius creativity, but also the direly needed funds in the sector to build regenerative business models that ultimately rebuild the soil, restore the ecosystems, so that whole move towards a regenerative economy. So obviously, both of us, we can't look into the future. But imagine it does not all collapse. Imagine the world, Zurich and Berlin, Uh, still exist in, let's say, 10, 20, 30 years time. Um, what are the crucial leverage points that you see from a conscious investing perspective and you driving the market that gives you most hope to provide and unlock this systemic uh, levers in the various sectors that you are involved in? I think uh, one of the most important starting points, dear Alistair, is really, um, you know, one's own power, actually. Uh, and I think raising personal consciousness, you know, becoming aware, actually, of, um, of the importance of your decisions that you make on a personal level, but also on the investment level. To me, this is... Uh, a tremendously important step and that also makes me so uh, hopeful because uh, at least in in let's say uh, my personal uh, kind of surroundings here but also in the larger investor community i've seen that so many people became way more conscious even through the pandemic you know everybody has realized uh, all of a sudden well Uh, as, as the tanker got stuck in the Suez Canal, oh Lord, I mean, that sourcing is, does not make sense. It's just also not sustainable. Uh, how crazy is that, that we ship in the cheap clothes from China that uh, even produced uh, maybe by children. Um, and the ships uh, are full with fossil fuels. So, uh, I mean, just this, like, I think that is a very, very important step that rise in uh, personal awareness and consciousness when it comes to your yeah, consumer and your investment decisions. I think this is a very important step. And um, what also makes me yeah, hopeful for, um, I mean, for, for, for those next years to come is uh, maybe I have it a bit easier than other people because I see so many cool solutions and this is what motivates me so tremendously. I see so utterly cool investment opportunities out there that have such a transformative impact 
be it whatever on the recycling i'm just mentioning something of uh for example um lithium ion batteries and this really has the impact to to kind of uh, drastically reduce the primary sourcing in developing countries, things like that, right? Or uh, as, as I spoke about um, the, the cultivated, um, whatever, meat sector, or the, the, the milk sector, all these things. I mean, there are so many cool solutions already out there. Um, what I think is similarly important that um, and that relates to our approach as a conscious investor that we very much take care also of biodiversity issues that are related to those investments, also on their sourcing side, for example, because, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's so important to, I mean, we anyway, right, and that's a, that's a whole other topic, what we see the, that there is like wildlife i mean um, i mean maybe, maybe just a very personal story um, i grew up as a as a child of a crazy fly fisherman and he always brought me my father to the river banks and we sat there for hours i mean he was standing in the water and i was standing there too and i mean the the, the cool thing was always when i catch the fish it's always catch and release so you never take the fish out my father just called me last week he was actually in norway and he said i'm like so sad because uh, there are not even no fish uh, in, in those rivers close to the Arctic cycle. But uh, what's even worse is that there are no, uh, no like insects, nothing. It's just nothing around anymore. And that's, that's really scary. And um, we really have to take also care of our biodiversity because we know when we don't have any bees anymore, um, yeah, how do we pollinate uh, yeah, the almonds in California? And um, so I think that again relates to the things that everything is very much connected, but um, I see a big urgency in things from a timing perspective, but I also see many amazing solutions and I'm extremely hopeful um, for the change that we can make. It's just all about action, not about words. It's just really moving uh, from the talk to the walk. I think this is really important. Thanks for the conversation, Christine. I really hope that uh, not only with your investments decisions, uh, but also you as the human being that you are and moving uh, the needle overall in the sector, in the market will really create the ripple effects that we all wish for and that are so direly needed. Thanks for the conversation. Thanks so much, Alistair, for the, yeah, so honest, open dialogue. and. Um, yeah, so let's, uh, let's remain committed and uh, yeah, let's remain very, very positive. Thanks.